All right. Well, good morning. Welcome to church. Glad you're here. Uh, grab your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Um, we're going to study the scriptures. We're going to read it aloud and then allow the Lord just to kind of speak to us as we kind of meditate on the words today. And um, if you would go ahead and stand to your feet, we're going to honor the reading of the word together. I'll, I'll read out loud. You just kind of follow along. If you don't have a copy, it'll, it's all right, it'll be on the screen. And uh, while you're standing, um, if you did not get the communion elements, as we heard just a minute ago, uh, we'll be taking communion at the end of our service. Uh, and so if you don't have elements, uh, kind of wave your hand now as we're all standing, and our host will make sure you get those. Uh, they won't be coming around later, so now is your last chance to get those elements if you didn't already have them, all right? Psalm 51, Psalm 51, we're nearing the end of this collection, uh, studying the Psalms, um, but today we're in Psalm 51, it, it might sound familiar to many of you, but here are the words of the Psalm, it says this, have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt and purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say and your judgment against me. It's just. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment of my mother, my mother conceived me. You, but you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even here. Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me, now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Don't banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God, who saves then I will sing joy, joyfully, then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. You do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. Look with favor on Zion and help her rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with sacrifices offered in the right spirit. With burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings, then bulls will again be sacrificed on your altar. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hey, you can be seated this morning. The, the big idea today that I want us to sink into our hearts is this. And if you're taking notes, you can write this one down. The shortest distance between us and God is our repentance. In fact, the shortest distance between you and any person in your life is your honesty. Uh, repentance is kind of what David is offering us in this psalm. He's kind of expressing some things of, of real, honest repentance, showing his heart and, and asking God to renew something in him and to bringing himself before God wholly in a way that is, that is honest, that is pure, that is right, that is true. And, and what we recognize is that he's bringing this honesty, this repentance, Asking God to reconcile and refresh this, this joy of salvation and this rightness with God. And, and the shortest distance between us and God is our repentance. Is our willingness to repent, the quickness of our repentance. Repentance is getting honest about what has interrupted our relationship. If we're meant to live in unbroken communion with God, 
then when we sin, it begins to erase kind of parts of that circle, if you will, to where we're fragmented, where it's not a whole connection anymore, where, where something is severed. We have a, a young dog uh, that we have, a, a new puppy in our house, and um, I'm not 100% sure he's not demon-possessed yet. We'll wait and see. Jury's still out on this one. Um, I'm being facetious. That's not a statement of theological positioning as it relates to animals and what in, does or does not inhabit them. Uh, I'm just simply saying, except for cats, I have a pretty strong theology on that one. Um, <clears throat> what this dog is like chewing everything. And, and one of the things that he's been doing, he's been chewing wires. And I, I found recently this wire that he had, chewed, had kind of chewed through. And, and what happens is that that fracture in the connection does not allow the electricity to pass through as it should. And that's a little bit of what happens in our lives when it comes to our rebellion, our sin. It kind of chews the ability uh, of the strength of connection that often gets interrupted by our sin and our connection with with the Lord. Um, I I think many of us live um, kind of with an awareness of our sin, but but I think if, I, if I'm being really honest, as it relates especially to, to, to most people, we tend to downplay the reality of sin present in our life. We, we have a tendency to um, kind of dismiss sin. Sometimes we dismiss it by saying, well, like everybody sins. And that really just gives us an excuse to justify something because we don't actually want to mature and grow beyond it. We have no intention of not repeating that behavior. We just don't want to feel ashamed in the moment. So we kind of dismiss it. We're like, well, everybody's, I mean, everybody sins. So like it's, and we kind of downplay it. Now I'm not looking for us to live dejected. I don't think we have to like walk around with sackcloth and ashes all of the days of our lives. I, I don't think that we need to uh, live deceived though either. I think it's an important reflection for us to stop and realize that our rebellion occurs when we live contrary to the ways and the working of God. When we live according to our own agenda, our own ideas, and what we feel to be right versus to what he has commanded us in the right. Uh, I think that um, we, we don't need to glorify our sin either, right? Like I, I think sometimes we sit around in church and we tell our story a little bit and we like start talking about how bad we were and like we start glorifying like the, the old way of living a little too much. Uh, I don't think that we need to hide it or, 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 or sugarcoat things, nor do we need to glory in it. Uh, there's this thing in music, um, I don't know if you've ever, if you, if you know much about music, but um, there's, there's some features in uh, the production of music. It, there's a feature called auto-tune. Um, and, and most songs have some of these kinds of effects where uh, when you're listening to a song on, uh, on Spotify or YouTube or the radio, there's, there's likely some effects uh, covering over uh, the, the sound of the instruments in the song. It, it helps um, no matter what, what the person or who the person is singing, it helps to automatically tune and align their voice to sound more accurately on pitch and to cover up some of the the cracks and the fades. And it kind of helps uh, strengthen the sound of what what you're hearing. Um, I think many of us today, it's really easy to live with spiritual auto-tune on. To, to convince ourselves that it's not as bad as what we thought or it's not a big deal or it's not quite, like I, I haven't done this. I mean, here's David pouring out his heart. He's murdered. He's committed adultery, um, uh, kind of done some things that, that would be rather abusive in nature as a king. And he's not sugarcoating any of it. And I think a lot of us, we read the life of David and we're like, okay, like, okay. So I like, I lied to my wife about something. She asked how she looked and I told her what she needed to hear. Maybe not quite how I felt. And like, like, so that's as bad as like, it's just a white little lie. And we auto tune our life thinking that it sounds better in the ears of God than maybe what it really does. We find ourselves kind of justifying motives in our heart. And we find ourselves like, like making excuses for the criticism and the critical nature of how we view other people. How we lash out instead of learning how to lament, how we... Uh
uh, grow with anger and act in our anger rather than recognizing that that isn't quite the way that Jesus would want us to live. And we're not quick to repent. We're quick to just dismiss at times. And David is reminding us that the shortest distance between us and God is our repentance and honest evaluation and articulation against God. Can I say it this way? Every act of sin is a rebellion towards God. It's a, it's a rebellion moving away from God. And yes, we all sin. And yes, we live in a fallen world marred by sin. This is, this is what theologians refer to as original sin. This doctrine of original sin is this understanding that sin exists in a world and we are born into a world marred and marked by sin and its gravitational pull is almost irresistible to the human soul. That regardless of how innocent we are born into our world, our world eventually corrupts, pulls, and distorts our lives to where our lives and our beings and our souls are indeed all marked and marred and impacted by sin in our world. And thus we all need a savior. Now, there's some distinctions that I want to bring. In fact, I was reading um, kind of uh, an article and, and a, a transcript of William Lane Craig. If you don't know who William Lane Craig is, he is a, a Christian philosopher, um, a, a Christian uh, apologist, and kind of a, a bit of a scholar and kind of a theologian, if you will. And, and he talks about this idea of original sin. And uh, many people believe that Psalm 51 and verse 5 is, is a statement of how we are all humanly born, like somehow inside of us our DNA uh, is sinful. And, and that's not quite what the doctrine of original sin says. And Psalm 51 is not really addressing that specifically. In fact, he says this about Psalm 51. He says, we don't really find the doctrine of original sin in Psalm 51 and verse 5. Sometimes those overzealous to find proof text for the doctrine of original sin appeal to this verse. But I think that is a mistake, he says, hermeneutically. The Psalms are poetry and they often employ hyperbolic language here as a way of saying how sinful David feels. The verse is not a theological reflection upon how the sin of Adam was imputed to David. Rather, it is just a poetic and a hyperbolic way of affirming his intense sinfulness or feeling of sinfulness before the Lord. Now, the doctrine of original sin is a biblical one, and it's found primarily in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. If, if you have your Bibles, flip real quick there, because I want, I want us to recognize that, that we're all born into a world marred by rebellion and drawn to rebellion. Thus, we are influenced to live in rebellious ways. Uh, Romans 5, starting in verse 12, Paul is kind of, articulating some of these, these realities for all of us. The, the original sin that we have all inherited, had imputed to us, says it like this. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone then sinned. Yes, people sinned before the law was given, but it was not yet counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. In, in other words, he's writing and saying that, that sin was abounding and working even though the law wasn't present. Like there are some things that transgress and transcend even the written moral code of humanity. There are other moral codes and realities that often lead us to walk away from God rather than toward God, even if it's not explicitly stated in the Old Testament law. This is kind of what he's getting at. Making a case that whether you live before the law, after law, under the law, there's still a rebellious attitude and action that's pulling us all the time. Verse 14 says, still everyone died from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. Even those who did not uh, disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. Now, Adam is a symbol of... Um, now, Adam is, where I just totally lifted my eyes and I missed it. There it is. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of, uh, of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness 
to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are all guilty of many sins. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So just as sin ruled over the people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God, resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Here's what Paul is helping us see and understand. That because of Adam's sin, his action, sin began to spread throughout all of the cosmos, ripping apart God's good created world. And that has an impact on every person born into that environment. I, I, I was praying a little bit this week, um, thinking about this, trying to, t- trying to find a great way to maybe modernly articulate it. And, and the best kind of that I've come up with up to this point, and so as with all illustrations, they kind of like break down at some point. So just take it for the basics of, of what I'm, I'm trying to say here. Adam's sin kind of opened the floodgates, if you will, to sin ruling and reigning and ruining humanity's relationship with God. Much like when water gets into your house and you don't take care of it, mold can begin to spread all over the house. And all who enter that house end up Eventually, if it's not taken care of, it can get so bad that it spreads so much that it impacts everyone who walks into that house. And Jesus shows up to remove, redeem, purify, cleanse, and begin to uh, reverse the impact of that sinful mold first in our individual lives and the impact happening to us individually, as a people, and then ultimately into the world itself. So what started wide and has moved singularly to each of us being impacted by rebellion, Jesus shows up and reverses that process and starts individually and is making its way of his redemption work to the where eventually it's not only just an individual, individual redemption and forgiveness, ultimately it will be all of the world and the cosmos to where the mold that is hidden in the unseen is removed and sin and death and evil are no more. Jesus redeems us and we've been impacted by the rebellion and the sin in our world. And we've lived in ways that transgress God's laws and his goodness and has broken down our very relationship with him. And he waits for us to repent. And what we see in Psalm 51 is so incredibly refreshing to me that there is a heart and a life and a posture God promises never to reject. It's a broken, contrite, and a repentant heart that God says he will not reject. Not one living with auto-tune, thinking you sound better than you really are, but one that removes all of the peripherals and is willing to acknowledge and get honest before God. So the question then is, if God won't reject a broken, contrite, repentant heart, How do we cultivate that kind of life and heart? What does a repentant life look like? Is it just a one-time moment of repentance and then we move on and we're covered for good? 
Or is there something ongoing that God invites us into so that our relationship and connection with God continues to be unbroken? And we get honest about that because the shortest distance between us and God is our honesty and repentance. And David helps us out. And the first thing I want us to see kind of as we look at the text that that a, a repentant life and a repentant heart look like, number one is this, we recognize. Everybody say recognize. We recognize our own rebellion, our own waywardness, our own drift, our own unrighteous anger and judgment. We, we recognize our own pull for greed and power and lust. We, we recognize our own shortcomings. We recognize that rebellion is within each of us and we recognize this because the Holy Spirit convicts us of it. He convinces us. He persuades us. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. And it comes to us often in, in one of three ways. It comes to us from the scriptures. It comes to us from an inward kind of uh, searing or an inward kind of prompting or impression. We would often refer to that as our conscience. And it comes to us often from other people who help point out the mistakes or help us see a blind spot of, of our own waywardness and helps bring us back to God, that sin comes in our lives and we have to recognize our rebellion. And one of the ways we recognize because the Holy Spirit convinces us, persuades us and convicts us of that sin. Now, conviction and condemnation are not the same thing. Conviction deals with the actions. Condemnation tries to deal with your identity. And, and Satan is the one who condemns, causing our identity to not be somebody who can belong to the Lord. But rather the Holy Spirit convicts us, helping us realize that there is something that is hindering our time with the Lord, our walk with the Lord, our relationship with the Lord, and ask us to come back and to renew that with him. Conviction comes to us through the Holy Spirit, which comes through the scriptures, it comes through impressions, it comes through other people. And when we recognize that sin has broken this fellowship, often the word of God says it's like a mirror to our souls. That when we take a look in the perfect liberty and law of the Lord, it causes to us to look in the mirror and see like, wait, I don't look like what that's describing. I think sometimes uh, another great understanding of kind of this, this sin is that sin is like a broken mirror. What was meant to be clear and perfectly where we can see God clearly sin comes and breaks the mirror. And now our, what we're seeing of God isn't really clear anymore. And our own rebellion often causes us to have a wrong understanding of God. And that's a challenge because until we see clearly and understand God properly, we will not accurately reflect him in the world around us either. But when we begin to see clearly God and see clearly what he does for us and, and see clearly kind of our own rebellion, it gives God an opportunity to come and cleanse that and shape that and bring a fullness to it. Now, David was doing this. He was acknowledging like, um, I've killed a lot of people, Lord. Like he wasn't just saying, Lord, forgive me for all of my sins, like in some general facet. He's getting a little bit descriptive of his sins. And I think that's important for us to recognize that, that it wasn't some general thing. It was a specific thing. So the Holy Spirit convicts us of something often specific. The, the next element of recognizing our own rebellion revolves a, a, a contrite heart, contrition in our heart. What is, what is contrition? It's, it's really our first and, and most important response to the conviction from the Holy Spirit. The word contrite means to be crushed and broken and sorrowful for sin, for, for missing the mark of right relationship with God. Charles Simeon said, one of the most fundamental marks of true repentance is a disposition to see our sin as God sees them. To see our sin as God sees them. I think that has two, two elements to it, where we recognize how our sin is breaking the heart of God and creating a distance in relationship that doesn't have to be there. 
But I also think it comes to the point when we recognize the heart of God, we recognize that it doesn't keep us from him anymore. And there's an element of having a contrite heart. The Holy Spirit can, convicts us. We begin to see our sin as God sees it, and it begins to break our heart too. And that brings us to a point of confession where we bring into the light and acknowledge and we admit and we take ownership of and we begin to accuse ourselves of the transgressions that we, how somehow we, we've simultaneously asked also in that process of forgiveness from God and, and absolution of our sins from Christ. It's, it's this uh, uh, understanding that we accuse ourselves of, of the guilt. I want us to uh, dust off the cultural um, incorrect framing of this word guilt for a second. Uh, somehow the world uh, and ourselves, and we've kind of uh, turned guilt into a feeling rather than a statement of fact. Because guilt is a statement of incorrect action. Did you commit the crime or did you not commit the crime? Not do you feel guilty for committing the crime or do you feel like what you did was wrong? That's not the guilt. Guilt is a statement of fact saying that was a wrong thing and you did it. Guilt removes the auto-tune from our actions. There's godly guilt. That's the conviction of the Spirit. Be like, nope, that was wrong and I did it. I think we have to be, now if we're not careful, if we are dismissing the guilt, hear me, we'll find ourselves in shame. And shame lives in the shadows, not in the light of Christ. Shame does not come from God. That is not how God works. He is, in fact, God wants to remove the shame that you feel by bringing you wholeness and salvation and redemption. But I think we need to understand that when we are confessing since the Lord, like, Lord, this was an act and I am guilty for doing this thing. I lied. I cussed out a customer. I uh, posted some things I didn't need to post. I took some things from work that I shouldn't have taken. I spread rumors about a coworker that weren't true. I committed sexual acts with somebody who I have not entered a covenant of marriage with. We get, we got to confess it. We got to articulate. We got to bring it into the light with the Lord. And, and this is part of the recognition of the rebellion that we, we've committed. And I think it's important for us to realize what we try to justify we're not allowing Jesus to, um, to justify it himself. In other words, we're not, we're not allowing him to, to really redeem that part because we're not really acknowledging that that part exists. We try to rationalize away why we sinned or blame shift our sin. Like David's not saying like, he, David's taking ownership. He's like, Lord, before you and you alone, I sinned. I know it impacted other people and they were wrong, but Lord, I, I committed it. I did it and it was against you. And he's accusing himself. He's not trying to justify it. Well, see, if, if this person hadn't, then I wouldn't have. He's not doing any of that. He's just owning it and he's bringing it to the Lord. And, and what I love about this idea of confession and bringing it to the Lord, John Calvin says it like this, that the beginning of repentance is the confession of guilt. Friends, God sees it all, yeah. But he's waiting for us to reveal it all to him. God sees it all, but he wants us to reveal it all to him. And the reason we can do this, the reason we can recognize our own rebellion and confess it to the Lord, the whole reason we can do it is because we know his character and his invitation for us to do it. First John says that if we confess it, he's faithful and just to forgive it. Like he's not going to run out of forgiveness. I've never brought something to the Lord and said, Lord, would you, would you forgive this? Uh, I did the wrong thing. I said the wrong thing. I acted in the wrong way. I'm guilty because of this. I've never once had the Lord say, um, I'm sorry. Could you repent for a different sin? Because I don't have any more forgiveness for that sin particularly. It's never happened. 
uh, my kids uh, have, have this, in their younger years, had this, this innocence about them to where um, as they would walk around, um, like we would be in a store or something and, and we're like, no, we're not, we're not going to buy that today. And we're like, we're not going to spend our money on that way. And they're like, but dad, it, it's, it's, it's your debit card. Just use your debit card. It works. It'll pay for it, dad. Just you, like, like in their mind, there was someone on the other side limitlessly supplying, right, into the bank. So all you got to do is swipe it and it's good. Uh, I think that's the kind of innocence we need to have in our understanding of the father's heart for us. Every time you recognize your rebellion and you confess it, you're swiping the card for a debt that's already been paid for. Never will it return insufficient funds in your account. This is why we can recognize our rebellion and bring it to the Lord. The second thing that happens for a heart to be repentant before the Lord. It's not just to recognize our rebellion, but to recognize that we need to renew. Somebody say renew. A repentant life is marked by a renewal of joy and obedience instead of the rebellion. We receive this life of the spirit working in us and we we receive this renewal. There's an element that says that this is something God does in us. He restores the joy of our salvation And at the same time, we renew our commitment to worship him, to turn in his direction. I think that when we recognize our rebellion, one of the the very next things we need to do is just begin to renew a heart and mouth of worship to the Lord. To ask the Lord to unseal our lips as David did so that we might praise his name. Can can I be honest? Well, I I know I can. Um, and And I always am. I'm just... That's really just me softening the blow about what I'm about to tell you. So I don't, I don't know. I just, here we go. Jesus said those who recognize they've been forgiven much, love much. In other words, their expressions of worship go beyond their personal preference. There is nothing so freeing than to lift your hands in worship knowing that you've been forgiven. And the appropriate response to the unlimited forgiveness of God in our direction is our worship. I've said it before, I don't use the expressions of worship because I like using those to clap, to sing, to dance, to kneel, to bow, to shout. These, these expressions of worship, I, I don't do them because I grew up in a Pentecostal charismatic environment. I do them, number one, because they're biblical. And the God who is getting the worship gets to define what love and worship looks like to him. Worship is defined by God, not by my preference. And number two, the reason I do it is because I know how much he gave up for me. And every time I lift my hands, I am resurrendering to his goodness. I am resurrendering to his love. I am resurrendering my life in love and adoration and worship for a God who before the foundations of the world decided to send his son to pay the price and cleanse me from my sins. And he's done the same for you and he's worthy of our worship. He doesn't just remove sin one time. He actually wants to transform the way we live. I I love seeing people uh, in our church who come and recognize their need for repentance and and a life change. And the people who recognize that, they'll come in and they will recognize they need to reorient their entire life around Jesus, not just try to get like the good Jesus and keep living however they want. The people who experience real transformation in their life are the ones who recognize their own rebellion and their waywardness and need God to renew in them a brand new heart, a brand new life. And so they reorient all of their life around this man, Jesus Christ. And that's when transformation happens. 
But I've also watched as many people come to church to be like, yeah, I could do a little bit better. I'd like to have a little bit better things in my life. And I really want to improve my life and better my life. And so I'm going to add some Jesus into the mix and hope that's good enough to get me out of hell and, and to see some things. And your life isn't actually being transformed. You're struggling with the same sins. You're dealing with the same habits, your same attitudes. Your mind hasn't shifted. Things haven't really renewed. Your worship and your affection and, and, and the idols of your life have not been taken out or removed from your life yet. And you're wondering why you haven't experienced the transformational work of God. It's so amazing for me to watch as people experience this transformation. Perhaps one of the best illustrations of this is in the New Testament in Luke chapter 17. There's a story of 10 men who are covered in this skin disease of leprosy. It, like this sinful mold, was spreading and deteriorating all of their being. And they come running to Jesus, asking, pleading with him, Jesus, would you heal us? Jesus, would you heal us? And Jesus says, go, be healed, and be cleansed. And he sends them off to go wash in the pool, and the water was going to, in some way, do this miracle. And as they are going to wash, the Bible says that they are healed. And as they're going, they recognize they've been healed. Most of them kept going. But then there was some that returned back to him to thank him, to worship him, to reorient their life around him, if you will. Listen to what it says in Luke 17. It's not going to be on the screen. Let me read it to you really quick. But one of them, one out of the 10, seeing that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice, unashamed for others to hear, gave glory to God. He fell face down at his feet, thanking him. And he was a Samaritan. That's a packed sentence that I don't have time to unfold for you. Then Jesus said, were not 10 cleansed? Where are the nine? Did any return to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he told him, get up and go on your way. Listen, your faith has saved you. Ten got healed. One got made whole. Ten got their sins forgiven. One had their life transformed. God doesn't want to just forgive your sins. He wants to renew your heart and life entirely. And when we reorient it, when we worship God, we begin to demonstrate this new loyalty in God, a result of his removal of our sins, which then gets us to the third component of a broken and contrite life, a life of repentance that lives not in rebellion, but in continual repentance before the Lord. Here's the third component. And this is the part most of us ignore at our own peril. Everybody say rebuild. There's something interesting in the text that kind of caught my eye. In verse 16, it says this of chapter 51 of Psalm. It says, you do not desire a sacrifice or, or I'd offer one. You don't want to burn offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. Then he says this, look with favor on Zion and help her rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with sacrifices offered in the right spirit. So on the first part, he says, you don't want sacrifices. In the next part, he says, rebuild the walls and then you'll want the sacrifices. What in the world is David trying to say? Thanks for the clarity, bub. Walls in ancient time were the way in which they protected and fortified from enemies encroaching in. Now, at this time, the walls in Jerusalem, they weren't really broken or fractured. He's not speaking literally of literal Jerusalem and literal walls. He's referring to something else. Gates being destroyed, walls being broken down. I believe that part of what David is alluding to was that we need to rebuild a consecrated life towards God as the final act of our repentance to God. 
What do I mean? I, I mean that not only confession of sin and contrition and all of these things, it must be followed by consecration of ourselves. This is where we return to righteous living. We make reparations of any damages done to other people because of our sin. We ask for forgiveness for people that we've slandered and gossiped and treated ill. We do the next step and then we take cautions and precautions so we don't commit the act again. We do what's ever necessary to remove the opportunity to repeat the behavior and the action. We rebuild the walls. We protect and fortify ourselves so, so that we're not tempted to go in that way. It's not a, a matter of being perfect, but rather practicing proper devotion and protecting our heart. The Bible says to guard your eyes, to guard your ears, to guard your mouth, to guard your heart. We need to build the proper walls of insulation up so that we are not accessing opportunities to repeat the patterns of sin. This is where most of us stop. Forgive me, Lord. I'm going to worship you, Lord until the next opportunity to sin comes because I haven't removed it from my life. I haven't eliminated that option for my life. I, I haven't made it really, really difficult to access that again because it's too inconvenient. It's too much of a challenge. I, I, wanna, I wanna still, like, like you know the news is jacking with your heart, but you're unwilling to turn it off and unsubscribe to pay for the TV stuff. You know every time there's a new show out and it's rated TVMA, you know you're going to watch it and justify a reason to watch it only to recognize that I probably shouldn't have watched that one. Why even create the opportunity? You know the DMs get hidden and removed and deleted so you can say what you want and do what you want and then delete them and nobody will ever be the wiser for it. Why even have the app to begin with? We're unwilling to take radical, practical action to rebuild the walls. See, because when we rebuild the walls, we're actually creating a fortified way of saying, now, Lord, my heart is in the right posture. Because I'm not just saying, Lord, forgive me for getting caught and realizing I did wrong. We're actually saying, God, I don't want to live that way anymore. I don't want to be controlled by money anymore. I don't want to be a workaholic and just work, 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 and, and think that it's bad. I don't want to just... Do these things that are contrary to your heart and your life for me. We have to rid ourselves of the opportunity to sin. A, a repentant heart is one that longs to be rid of sin and to be made new by God. This week I got an, uh, an email. There's an email subscription that I, I subscribe to from a pastor out in New York. And this week, his email was just so good, and it relates with what we're talking about, about rebuilding the areas of our life, finding renewal, and recognizing our own kind of rebellion and our own weak spots even, like where we're vulnerable and susceptible. And I, want, I just want to read you the email. It was just too good not to, to read, and then we're going to come to a moment of reflection and repentance and taking communion together. The email says this, this past Sunday... Someone came forward for prayer in our church. It was a request I have not been able to get out of my head. The gist of it was this. I came to New York with a passion to give into sexual sin and temptation. I did that for a couple of years, but a while back, Jesus called me out of my sin unto himself. I have consecrated my sexuality to Jesus, but there is this last little 2% I want to give him. It needs to be put to death the last little 2%. It made me wonder if there were small little sins lingering under my larger surrender. Was I holding back my own 2%? Abba Anthony of the Desert Fathers gave an illustration of the need to hold nothing back in our lives with God. A brother renounced the world and had given his goods to the poor, but he kept back a little for his own personal expenses. He went to see Abba Anthony, and when he told him this, the, man, the old man said to him, If you want to be a monk, go to the village, buy some meat, 
Cover your naked body with it and come here like that. The brother did so and the dogs and the birds tore at his flesh. When he came back, the old man asked him whether or not he had followed his advice. The young man showed him his wounded body and Abba Anthony said, those who renounce the world but want to keep something for themselves are torn in this way by demons who make war on them. This is so true. Those unsurrendered parts, those parts we keep back can be access points of temptation, distraction, and spiritual sabotage. I want to join my brother at the altar this week asking God to kill the final 2% of sin in me. Clayton Christensen, the former renowned Harvard Business School professor once said, it's easier to hold your principles 100% of the time than it is to hold them 98% of the time. There's so much lost energy in the 2%. So much wrestling, so much decision fatigue, so much pressure moment by moment, but total surrender leads to total peace. All the energy given to resisting can sin can be given to building the life we're actually called to. Are there areas of your life that you need to bring to the altar? Any small sins hiding under your larger commitment? Anything you sense the Lord asking you to lay down? Why not take a moment and follow the wisdom of King David with the wisdom of the spiritual MRI in Psalm 139? Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know any of my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Is there a little 2% laying under your larger surrender to the Lord that you've already made? Are there opportunities that you've left open, walls that you need to rebuild so you aren't tormented? Is there a decision in your heart to say, I want to make Jesus the center of everything in my life and I want to give my energy 100% of the time to pursuing Him, not just trying to avoid sin. I want to be consumed with Him. That's my prayer today. I hope it's your prayer today. Search me, God. Is is there 2%? Some of you are like, 2%? I feel like it's more like 92% I need to surrender. Today's the day. Today's the day. A broken and repentant heart, God will never reject. As we recognize, renew, and rebuild our life toward Him. I want you to grab your communion elements and just hold them in your hands. If you want to open them, you can go ahead and do that. I I want to give us 30 seconds to just do that spiritual MRI. God, is there anything in me? Is there 2%, 20%, 80% that's not surrendered? Are there things I need to rebuild? Are there things and attitudes that I, I haven't been honest about? Asking God to search us. And then, after this 30 seconds, there'll be a, a prayer that we'll be putting up on the screen. A prayer of confession to the Lord. And we are together, read that out loud, making public confession to the Lord. And then we're going to partake of the elements as an act of receiving the life of God, the forgiveness of God, the wholeness of God, as we do. So let's take the next 30 seconds. Holy Spirit, is there anything in us we need to repent for? Search our hearts, God.
pray this prayer aloud together. It's up on the screen. Ready? Let's read it. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We confess that we have often failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. Forgive us, we pray, and free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Now let's take the bread. So, Lord, would you create in us that clean heart? Continue to renew a right spirit and help us rebuild the areas of our life to fortify us so that we live in complete devotion to you and not devotion to the ways of the world. Thank you for your forgiveness and your wholeness. And we, like that one leper, want to return with worship and adoration and thanksgiving for all you've done. And so together we just say, thank you, Jesus. Can you say that with me? Just say, thank you, Jesus. We're grateful. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's speak blessing over one another. It'll be up on the screen. Nice and loud, nice and strong. Ready? Let's read. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Listen, if you need prayer, maybe the Lord's been working something in your heart today. We haven't seen they'd love to pray with you about that or, or anything that you're walking through. We'd love to, to pray with you. Our host will be there at the doors to collect your cups as you go. And this Wednesday, first Wednesday prayer, we'd love to see you seven o'clock. Go in God's grace and peace. I really hope today's message was life-giving. As a church, we want to help you encounter God and take another next step in your allegiance to Jesus. I want to ask you to take a step right now, in fact. Would you just share this message with a friend? Maybe post it on your social, text a coworker the link. Just be sure to include something that you learned or how it impacted you personally. When you do that, you get to be a part of seeing faith come to life in someone else. And don't forget to visit our central hub, faithchurchks.org. You'll find other next steps that you can take in your faith, including giving and partnership with us as we help others encounter Jesus like you've encountered him. Hey, we love you. And until we get to hang out again, remember, don't shrink back from your faithful allegiance to King Jesus.